This is how glacier ice looks. You see the two fingers holding a piece of ice, and you can see it's smacked full of bubble bubbles. It's almost impossible, or actually it is impossible, to make this ice artificial in the laboratory. Because this is not frozen water. Normally, we perceive ice as frozen water. But glacier ice in Greenland and Antarctica is not frozen water. It has never been water. It started basically as water vapor in the atmosphere, and then it, this water vapor came to Greenland and it became so cold that when it condensated into a cloud, it bypassed being water. It went straight from air into ice. And these snowflakes fell on the ice and were buried. But as layers and layers are put on top, the weight increases as the layers become more and more deeply buried. And at 18 meters depth, the weight is so high that the snow is compacted into glacier ice. And in this process, all the air between the snowflakes is trapped in those tiny bubbles. So the ice core not only contains the impurities of the atmosphere, like volcanic ash and, and sulfuric acid and dust and things, the ice core also contains samples of the air before we started to pollute it. And that's why these ice cores represent our very best source of information on past atmospheric composition, and we have, through our work, provided the international community with the first fixed numbers on how much greenhouse gas was in the atmosphere before industrialism began. Let's have a look at what, these, what the isotopes tell us about past climate, that is, cloud temperature back in time. And this is the Antarctic ice core from Dome C, it's a grandfather of ice cores, and down here it's present, and as I go over here it gets older and older and older, and this is 800,000 years. The curve is based on the isotopes. That's why I say, instead of having too many degrees cent temperature over here, I have isotopic values. But this part of the curve here, that level, represents the last 11,000 years. This is our time. All human civilization has evolved in this period of time. Everywhere we go, in India, South America, China, the Middle East, Egypt, so on, everywhere we find ruins of earlier civilizations. It's younger than 11,000 years. There are no traces of urbanized, agriculturally based civilization in the Ice Age only in the last 10,000 years. That means that humanity's common memory only stretches back in a climate that is this, up here. And if you go back in time, you can see how often it has been just as warm as now or warmer. Very rare. This big dip represents what we in Denmark call the last ice age. When the curve was down here at the bottom 25,000 years ago, there was 400 meters of ice where, I, where we sit here now, stand here now. Copenhagen was ice covered. The ice margin was 200 kilometers to the west over by Lillebit. So this is the last ice age. Then you can see this spike. This is what we call the previous integration. You know, it's like the pause in the soccer match. And then you have an ice age, a short interval, an ice age, short interval, ice age, and so on. If you go back 800,000 years, there have been eight ice ages and to a varying degree some short intervals. So if you look at the overall picture, the normal thing is actually an ice age. And the exception is what we perceive as normal. 
our climate. When I started in ice core research 30 years ago, we didn't know all that from ice cores because this ice core is approximately 10 years old. But we knew there had been a sequence of ice ages, and we knew already at that time that the interglacials were shorter. So, of course, the objective of doing ice core research at that time was to say, hey, looking at this figure, when does this end and when does the next ice age start? To try to come to, to comprehend these violent climatic swings from here to here represents a jump in Antarctic temperatures of 9 degrees. In Greenland, this jump represents 25 degrees on average temperature. Can you imagine today it's minus 33 in Greenland in the middle, at that time it was minus 58. What was the cause of these huge swings in climate? And there it turns out that the astronomers have an answer to some of it. It's called the Milankovitch theory. It's based on the fact that the Earth has a rotational axis. That's in fact what gives us the seasons. Why we have summer and winter is because we have a tilting axis of the Earth. But this Earth axis is not stable. It's like a top. It goes like, it wobbles like this. And it also makes what we call precession. That means that the axis makes a sweep like this. So if you combine those two, it's a wobble and a sweep at the same time. And also, the Earth's orbit of the Sun is elliptical. It's not round, it's elliptical. But this ellipticity or eccentricity varies. Sometimes it's like this, sometimes it's like this. These three movements in the Earth orbit and the Earth axis have three cycles. One is 40,000 years, one is 100,000 years, one is 22,000 years. And they influence how strong the summer is on the Northern Hemisphere. Or you might say, hey, come on, the Earth is round. It doesn't matter which way you turn it, it receives the same amount of solar energy. So who cares about the axis? And you're basically right. But the trouble is right now that nature has made it so that 80% of all the continents happen to be in the Northern Hemisphere, leaving the Southern Hemisphere basically covered by water. And this non-symmetric build-up creates the sensitivity for this Milankovitch force. If we would have an even distribution of continents, we, the Earth would not be sensitive to this. But right now, all the continents happen to be in the North. Calculating with the astrono astronomical parameters, we can explain these swings as effects of astronomical forcing. And using that, we went back and said, hey, that's fine. So if we take the Earth orbit right now and look back in time and find out when was the last time in the past that the Earth orbit was as it is now? Well, the part of it today happens to be, luckily enough, this bubber here, as you can see, it's a whole lot wider than the other ones. Lucky for us. This one is called the fifth last ice the fifth last interglacial, and if we do a comparison of those two, the blue one is the one that happened 430,000 years ago, and the red one is from our time, last ice age ending in our interglacial. And using that. You can say, hey, we have at least 10,000 years more to go before you run into the next ice age. Wonderful. That one little comforting thought. We can remove the fear for ice ages because I don't think any of us would like to think ahead 10,000 years. Except for the guys that want to bury a nuclear waste in Finland. They have to think 100,000 years ahead to make sure that this radioactive stuff is not exposed. So, we are in that way okay. But I want to kick in another remark that was hopefully spare some questions later on in the bar, 
If I go back to this, there was a paper in, in Science 2008 where some geophysical signal analysis, that's the guy who looks at frequencies of signals and looks at how this signal has behaved. And you can see actually it starts to become more and more erratic as we go along. If I extend this curve, I cannot do it with ice cores, ice cores, but I can use ocean sediment cores that will take me back 40 million years back in time. You will see that this is just the end tail of a long cooling trend of the globe. Using that, the two blogs said, okay, we're looking at the signal content of this. It actually simulates the electric signal from the heartbeat of a patient with a heart attack coming. And to take it literally, and uh, they said that when the next ice age kicks, kicks in, most likely there will be the blip, 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 beep, and then nothing. Because when the next ice age begins, it will be the last because it will be permanent. So as the gospel goes right now is that the earth is heading into deep freeze. And the reason why the earth is heading into deep freeze is not because we are doing anything right now or somebody else is doing anything right now or the plants are doing different things. It's for one basic reason alone. It's the moving of continents and plate tectonics. We cannot fight the fact that the Himalayas are growing by 10 centimeters a year. And we cannot fight the fact that the Andes and the Rocky Mountains are still growing. They are mountain chains in the making. And what particularly the Himalayas are formidable in doing is that nature has built its own Chinese wall between India and China. And when all the beautiful, moist monsoon from the Indian Ocean wants to go up to Asia, it runs ram into a mountain chain. And you probably know, you heard about the Bergen effect, why it always rains in Bergen and Norway. It's because as soon as wet air hits the mountain chain, it's forced up. And then it's forced to cool. And then the water drops out of the clouds, and when the air comes over on the other side, it's bone dry. All the water stays on one side of the mountains. That's why we have the floodings in Pakistan. That's why we have the floodings in India. It's a bloody waste of water, if you ask me. But that's how nature has made it. And since the mountains are growing all the time, it doesn't sound as much 10 centimeters a year. But multiply that with a million years, you get a lot. In fact, we know that the Himalayas, and in particular the Tibetan plateau behind the Himalayas, has grown by one and a half kilometers in altitude in the last million years. That makes Central Asia a dry place. And the most important greenhouse gas on this planet is water vapor. And if you dry air, force the water out of it by a mechanical barrier like a mountain chain, you leave no greenhouse effect behind those mountains. That's why it gets really cold in Siberia. And that's how we figure the Earth has gone into a deep freeze. Greenland became glaciated as a consequence of this. Antarctica is a slightly different story because Antarctica happened to be the real loser in the movement of continents. Antarctica used to be connected with Africa, South America and Australia. And then all the other continents decided 100 million years ago to slide away. India also was... Did you know India was connected to Antarctica once? It's crazy. But India actually used to sit right next to South Africa, wedged between Australia and South Africa up to the Antarctic continent. 100 million years ago, India decided to play the speedboat of continents. And it's moving so fast northward, by 10 to 20 centimeters a year, now it's ramming into Asia. So you see the result of the crash, the Himalayas. 
But all the cancers moved away and it left poor little Antarctica all alone on the South Pole, all of a sudden surrounded by ocean. And as soon as this continent on the South Pole was surrounded by ocean, the Earth's rotation made sure that the water around Antarctica just started to run in circle around the continent, cutting off all the beautiful heat from the equator. Somebody failed to pay the heat bill and the continent went into deep freeze. So, we cannot do anything about that, but at least we can try to understand the dynamics behind these climate changes. So, what we wonder about sometimes is, what is the interplay? How can a tiny, tiny little forcey, like this Milankovic axis wibble wobble, trigger such big things as ice ages? I mean, these are big, this is big stuff. During the ice age, there was more ice over Canada and North and, and the US, northern US, than is in Antarctica today. And even Scandinavia had a huge ice cap. There were, in fact, there was so much ice that the oceans of the world were lowered by 120 meters. You could walk to England from here if you didn't get stuck in the ice that is. So what we did was, in this project, we crushed the ice samples from these depths and we took out the carbon dioxide, which is a greenhouse gas, from the bubbles and we plotted them on the same scale. This is today, this is 800,000 years ago, but this curve shows you the content of the greenhouse gas carbon dioxide measured in the ice. It looks pretty darn similar to the climate curve somehow. So let's try and put the two on top of each other. Oh, as a physicist, I would say that's a rather good correlation right there. It looks like when it's warm, there's a lot of greenhouse gas. When it's cold, there's not so much greenhouse gas, which makes somehow good sense. But, um, once we are this far, particularly in the current discussion with man-made global warming and things, we should actually go to the next little question here, and that is, yeah, we can see they're connected, but it would be great to know which one is first. What is the cause? What is the effect? So, meticulously analyzing all these very sharp transitions from ice age to interglacials, we love these sharp ones because there we can sort of constrain a lot of things and we can have a look at it in detail. If you go into these and check it out, you find that actually temperature comes first. And that means what we see here in this curve is actually something like the global, the global oceans start to warm, then carbon dioxide increases, this enhances the greenhouse effect, causing the global oceans to warm, in releasing more CO2, in enhancing the greenhouse effect again. And what you see, you find a beautiful feedback loop where a small change can trigger a big variation because there's a positive feedback, as we call it. You have a built-in amplifier. The greenhouse gases, methane and carbon dioxide, play in this role as natural amplifiers of small things. And now we start to begin to see that our climate system is pretty darn sensitive to even small changes. And that means that a tiny little push can move the rock down the mountain. Let's go to Greenland. Now, Antarctica, you could go back 800,000 years. But in Greenland, you cannot go that far back in time. And the reason is very simple. Where we drill this Antarctic ice core, the annual snowfall is this much. Where we drill cores in Greenland, the annual snowfall is this much. And that means if you drill down 10 meters in Greenland, you'll go back, say, five, six, seven years. If you drill 10 meters in Antarctica, you'll go back 200 years. So you get, in Antarctica, you get back in time by rocket speed, while in Greenland, it takes a while. 
On the other hand, having layers that thick from the beginning also means that we can actually, we have actually snow from each month during the year. That's why we can distinguish summer snow from winter snow by cutting little samples. And as you squeeze them, the information is still kept. So Greenland actually has less time, but with higher resolution. You get 100,000 years stretched over three kilometers ice, where in Antarctica it's 800,000 years, so it's squeezed eight times as much. This is one our camp in Greenland is called the Neem Camp in May 2009. You see it from the air. All the analysis we do is done in snow caves underneath the surface because ice cores really don't like melting temperatures or warm temperatures. We like to keep them wonderfully cold. So by digging snow caves, we can maintain the, temp maintain the temperature below minus 20 degrees, which is nice. Requires some extra boots, some gloves, but otherwise okay. We are using these aircraft to get in and out of the ice. Of course, you could say, why don't you drive things up by tractor trains? Unfortunately, you cannot do that in Greenland because the green ice sheet all around the edge is full of crevasses. And there's no way around it. You have to go over the edge, so to say, to get it in. So as we are collaborating with the National Science Foundation in the US, we have access to the use of these planes. And sometimes when the snow is very, very heavy, we have to get airborne using these rockets. So what you see here is actually a C-130 getting airborne, rocket propelled. There are four similar rockets on the other side. And I can tell you when you sit as a passenger inside the plane when this happens, it's, it's a good show. Um, this is the landing strip we have. In fact, we have to make an airport. So what you have here are flags marking the landing strip on the snow so the pilots have something to fly to. And over here you see the camp structure. You see some buildings here, and there we have visitors coming in. It's a C-130 coming in with a new about 10 tons of cargo to the camp. And as you can see now, it's a very special airport because these planes have skis on. So um, it is a special branch of airport operations we have up there on, on the snow. Passengers are sitting sideways in the C-130, so you can imagine how it goes this way when you hit the snow and make a break. Now, when you go into the camp, the snow is there, the undisturbed snow actually looking out to what we call the scientific area, where nobody is allowed to walk because it's set aside for scientific purposes. We don't want to have people driving around with snowmobiles and things out there to pollute the snow. But otherwise, you have this little tiny tent building, and it's hiding a lot of stuff. Let's go into that. This is inside the tent building. We have a staircase leading down and an elevator for cargo. And if we go down that, that staircase, we come into the caves. You see the roof is up there. It's a six meter deep snow cave. This is where we do the drilling. Of course, when the project is over and we're packing down next year, nothing will be left behind, I can assure you. <laughs> so that's why all the electrical installations are just put up with bamboo so we can easily take it apart. This is uh, our mechanic, Stephen Bohansen, making the drill ready. You see he is now actually mounting the cutters on the drill. And this is the drill head that can rotate. Here you see the cutters. And uh, he's now checking that the little knives that should hold the ice core are in place. And then we tilt the drill into vertical. The bottom goes into a cut in the floor and the top goes up in the roof. And then the hole is down here. This way of tilting, we can easily take out the ice cores as we produce them. And then, of course, we need a lid on top because we don't want somebody to lose a tool or something down that hole. That would be terrible for the drilling. And now we're ready to send the drill down in the hole. Last check. This is the, the bottom part is the rotating part. This is the electronics and the motors that allows us to remote control the drill and keep check on everything is okay. And then you may wonder how we make it rotate down in the hole if it's hanging in the cable. Well, the explanation is here because on top of the motors you have these three skates. You see these three blades? 
they squeeze out to the sides of the hole and fix it so it can't rotate. So the top cannot rotate, only the bottom part. But it can easily slide up and down. There you have it. That's why we can drill even with having a drill hanging in the cable. When the ice cores come out in one piece, they look like this. Again, nothing to see. Here you have a long piece of ice. Everything has to be measured. And that's done in the laboratory next door. This is our laboratory at Nîmes where we have all kinds of different scientific setups, including some insulated boxes where we have uh, chemical laboratories and so on, where the ice core is analyzed. A total of 30 to 35 people have been working there for three years, for three months, so a total of nine months of 30 people. We've had approximately 120 young scientists in the field at Nîmes. They exchange every month. Then we cut the core into bits. The one important factor is you can never give away a sausage slice of an ice core because then you give away a layer of the climatic history. So before you start to give samples out, you have to spread it along to keep a reference piece. That's why we have a predetermined cutting schedule of the core. Then we can analyze it with a camera. You see this camera is sliding along the core and you're cloning. And here you can see how it can pick up a lot of layering, mainly related to the dust in the ice. And here you can see the activity in the science trench when they analyze ice cores. Remember these guys they have to cut and analyze two and a half kilometers of cores in two summers. That's a lot of ice. It's 30 meters a day. So it has to go like assembly line in a factory. And that's why you see this sort of pretty choreographed assembly line production. People are starting machines that take care of themselves while they do other tasks and every, everything is sort of laid out for the whole analysis. Here is a curve just indicating to you the vast amount of samples that we've collected. She's cutting tiny bits of ice that are analyzed for these isotopes I mentioned before, and we have to pack them in individual bags. One ice core is sometimes cut into 60,000 little bits and then put in little bags, and we should not confuse the numbers because then we mix up the climate history, so we have to be very careful. But once they go into the machine and they're measured, we can stack them into curves, putting each little piece of ice on top of each other. And you cannot see it from down there, but a little spike like that represents actually eight blocks of ice. So if you have several thousand of them, you can actually start to make what we call profiles. And here, in these profiles, everything that's marked with black is summer snow, and everything that's white is winter bottoms. So you can actually see it's pretty easy to count years back in time. So we go back in time. We count, we determine the age. And then all of a sudden we find a layer with very high content of sulfuric acid from a volcanic eruption. And the famous one is Iceland, full of volcanoes. Need I say Eyjafjallajökull? Or this summer it was Grimsvatn. But otherwise, they have some quite spectacular eruptions, like this one right here, called Lucky. It's a fissure eruption that happened 1783. That one eruption produced 55 cubic kilometers of lava. It's very difficult to perceive the size of that lump, but it would equivalent the island of Amar growing to one kilometer height in one summer. So it's a very big lump of lava. Also with the lava came a lot of gases and acids. And in fact, the fallout of fluoride from the volcano killed a vast amount of the livestock in Iceland. One third of the population almost perished from starvation. 
and it led the Danish king and administration at that time in 1783 to start evacuation plans to evacuate the entire Icelandic population from Iceland because they were dying. Luckily for the Icelanders, the volcano stopped, but it has a mark in the ice. This is our sulfuric acid content in the ice, the blue curve, and here are our counted years. 1779, 1780, 1781, 1782, 1783. A huge eruption. Now that was a piece, that was an easy piece to do because the history books have recorded this in 1783, so who cares? But uh, it's interesting to see the size of it. And of course we have recorded a lot of more volcanoes in Iceland. Some of them are even prehistorical. <coughs> 